Welcome back to Passionately Catholic. I am Anthony Digman, and today I have something very special for you. Just a little while ago, I was invited by a former uh, student of mine, Abby Anderson, to be a part of her podcast called Seeking After Him. And she asked for my conversion testimony and how I came to find Jesus Christ and the truths that Jesus Christ has shared with us in his church, the Catholic Church, and especially why I'm Christian, why I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, and why I am a Catholic. Like especially a passionately Catholic. Abby generously allowed me to use the audio uh, from her podcast to be on Passionately Catholic for you to enjoy as well. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode. If you enjoy it, be sure to check out Abby Anderson's podcast, Seeking After Him. God bless you and enjoy. Hey there, welcome to the Seeking After Him podcast a podcast all about getting to know Jesus through the testimony of his word and through other Christians. Pull up a seat and make sure you're cozy as we dive into today's episode. Without further ado, here's your host, Abby. All right, well, hello everyone and welcome back to the Seeking After Him podcast. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Abby Anderson and I am so excited that you're here tuning into another episode with me today. I am super pumped to have this awesome guest on the podcast today. Anthony, why don't you just say hello to everyone and give us a brief introduction to who you are. Hello, everybody. My name is Anthony Digman. I'm actually a former religion teacher of Abby here. I know her by her mm-hmm. maiden name, so it's always fun for me to hear yeah. Abby Anderson. Um, but yeah, it's so great to get on this with you, Abby. And um, I love the title of this, the Seeking After Him podcast, because that's what our life is all about. I mean, if we're spending our life and we're not seeking after the Lord, what is our whole life worth? So I just love uh, the title that you chose for this this Thank podcast. <laughs> so it's great to be with you. So yeah, my name is Anthony Digman. Um, I have been active in uh, the Catholic Church since uh, professionally as an author and speaker, as a religion teacher, as a uh, director of religious education for um, children's religion classes and stuff since 2006 uh, professionally. So that's been a blast. I've written a few books uh, and just constantly seeking after the Lord and trying to discern the Lord's will in life and where he wants me to go with a variety of things. So I've had the pleasure of wearing a number of, the pleasure and the challenge, I guess, of wearing a number of hats uh, professionally over over the years trying to discern, well, Lord, where are you calling me to now in this life? And what work do you want, uh, do you want me to do? So, yeah. I love it. I feel like you are just the testimony of like, just putting your faith out and being like, God, here I am, just send me. Then when you talk about wearing different hats, because I feel like you range a lot in terms of like you teach, like you said, you are also a speaker and an author. Can you just like dive into some of your books that you've wrote and like how that kind of encouraged you to get started in that or like what was like the guideposts to some of the books that you wrote? Sure. So my books, the first one that I wrote is called um, Sign of Contradiction, Catholic Teaching on Contraception Family, uh, Contraception and Family Planning. And that was my uh, master's thesis when I was working on my master's in theology at Loris College in Dubuque. Um, and I really, what, as I was writing it, I'm like, this is something that I'm incredibly passionate about because um, as Christians, I think a lot of times we, especially followers of the Lord, we're willing to let Jesus into various parts of our life. And then we put up guards and we put up resistance in certain areas like our money. Sometimes we go, okay, you Lord, yes, I'm going to follow you, but I'm yeah, with my money. I want to do this. You know, and we don't let the Lord be a hundred percent in control of what we do with our money. And definitely in the bedroom and our sexuality is another area in which I think a lot of times we stop and we say, Lord, yeah, you're the Lord of my life, but oh, maybe not in the bedroom. Um, so as I discovered the uh, history of Christianity and how we approach our sexuality, chastity, um, and our fertility specifically, I was a bit blown away by the differences between our modern culture and what Christianity has said for thousands of years, really up until the 1900s. It was really the 1930s when this issue of contraception really started to shift in Christianity to allow it so much. And I really got interested in that debate and the development and all that kind of stuff and really got convicted that, uh, especially as a Catholic, but I think Christians in general who are going to follow the Lord and be Bible-based, 
least, is that we contraception, there's a lot of issues with contraception and even the contraceptive mentality, the desire to have intercourse and not have children come from it intentionally. There's a lot of major problems with that. So I really got excited about that. That became my, my master's thesis. It grew into my first book. Okay. My next book, uh, I love um, Star Wars. I've always liked Star Wars. <laughs> it's always been a part of my life. Um, since I was really, really little, I used to watch recorded uh, episodes or not episodes, the recorded movies on VHS tapes of the Star Wars movies that were recorded off TV. Uh, I grew up watching those. So um, I knew I had to write a book on Star Wars and uh, Catholicism or Christianity. Most of it's pretty Christian based. There's some explicitly Catholic stuff in there, but uh, it's pretty broadly Christian. Uh, basically unpacking Star Wars from a, a Christian Catholic perspective and saying, hey, this is the stuff where our faith is at work in the Star Wars universe. So that more recently has also turned into a YouTube channel called Catholic Plus. And it's basically a commentary on Disney Plus content, but from a Catholic perspective. That's great. And again, a lot of that is mostly Christian. It's about 90% Christian, and there's some explicitly Catholic stuff in there. But um, Catholic Plus, you know, I've been diving into Star Wars, um, Marvel Cinematic Universe a little bit. I've been really impressed by Encanto. I was shocked. Mm. I have a, uh, a patron through Patreon who was like, you have to check out Encanto. And I was like, why? Like Encanto, I'm feeling like this is going to be Disney spells, witchcraft. Yeah. Yeah. Cause Disney gets into that sometimes yeah. and really turns me off. Um, and I was like, all right, I'll give it a watch. And I was blown away. I'm like, wow. I think that this is the most, most Christian or even there's definitely Catholic, specifically Catholic elements in there too. The most Christian Star Wars, or I'm sorry, the most Christian Disney animated film I've ever seen. I'm going to have to go back and rewatch it now and just like have a different perspective as I watch it. <laughs> right, right. So definitely watch it first. But I did a seven part video series on that on Catholic Plus that breaks it down. That's awesome. Um, that was a lot of fun to do because it was a real big surprise to me. And I had a couple conversations conversations with a couple of grandmas whose grandkids are watching in Kanto and they're serious Christians and they're concerned about their, their grandkids and the things that is coming out of Disney. And they're like, I don't know if they should be watching this. And I'm like, and Kanto's fine. Like check out the video <laughs> series. You can make so many great connections, especially to the Holy spirit. It's absolutely amazing. The, the concepts of fire, Holy spirit, the gifts, the charisms are just incredible in Encanto. So I highly recommend that one. Speaking of witchcraft and stuff like that, uh, my third book was on uh, the Catholic church is teaching on demons and exorcism uh, is really kind of a spiritual warfare book uh, in preparing us for spiritual battle um, and all that kind of stuff. And, and what demons are, where do they come from? What do they want? Uh, what is the ministry of deliverance and exorcism uh, throughout history and within Catholicism explicitly? Um, what was Jesus's ministry against demons? What did that look like? And I found fascinating. Some people don't want to deal with demons and they mm -hmm. don't want to deal with any of that, that type concept. They get afraid of it, right? But the very first power and authority authority that Jesus Christ gave his disciples, his apostles, was what? Driving out demons, right? <laughs> yeah. If the very first power and authority Jesus gives his disciples, his 12 apostles, is to drive out demons, there's something serious going on there, right? So Amen. started digging into that more seriously. And that book's probably the shortest. It's just an intro book. Uh, I actually use it for my moral theology class in teaching them about the first commandment. And God's got to be number one because all of the, the demonic and occult activity violates the first commandment. So we talk about yeah. staying away from psychics and mediums and fortune tellers and all that kind of stuff, Ouija boards and why. Um, so that, that's that been a fun book to write. Uh, I've got another one coming out in a little while that I did work with, uh, Guiding Star which is a national organization that's basically the antidote to Planned Parenthood. Um, wow. Abby Johnson is a major player in there. If you know Abby Johnson, she's a former Planned Parenthood director uh, turned advocate against Planned Parenthood. Wow. Um, and she, when she grasped the Guiding Star vision, she's like, this, this is the antidote basically to Planned Parenthood. It's full support for women from fertility to um, caring for their children, um, at breastfeeding, all all of that kind of stuff on the beauty of feminine fertility. Uh, so that has really that was really an offshoot of my first book on contraception and family planning. And we uh, we did a two part book series, and I helped with the second book, um, really unpacking more of, of female fertility and the beauty of that fertility um, from a Christian perspective, uh, Catholic perspective yeah. as well. So that's been a lot of fun. It's been a lot of work, but it's been a joy to be a part of those projects. That's awesome. I feel like specifically all of those topics are very like almost like countercultural. Like it's really like where our culture is really at right now. And it's just speaking truth into those. So I think that is 
absolutely awesome and definitely something that our culture and society needs needs to hear about. So that's great. I love it. <laughs> On that subject, you know, I think one of the best ways to find authentic Christianity is the opposite of what the world says. <laughs> amen. Oh my gosh. Amen. I think, have you ever seen the TV series The Chosen? Like, have you ever seen Parts the intro? Of it, yes. Okay. So the intro of it is, it's um like the fish swimming and they're all gray, but then it's like the yeah. blue fish going against the current. And yep. I just think that is such a beautiful image of Christianity and like Catholicism in general. It's, it's really like us going against the culture, like the current of culture. So I think that is like a great visual analogy of For that. sure. All right. Well, I'm excited for you to share your faith testimony um, because I've heard a little bit, bits and pieces, like you said, you were my teacher in high school. So that was one of the jokes we were talking about before we even got started was, do I call you Mr. Digman or do I call you Anthony? (laughs) I don't know what to call you. So he's like, no, just call me Anthony. So I am just excited for you to share your testimony um, and how you got to where you're at and like where you're at right now and things. So I'm going to let you take the reel and you just go for it. Sounds good. Well, thanks so much for the invitation to be here with you, Abby. And great to join you and share some of this story. So uh, I grew up in a mixed Christian family. My mom was uh, Lutheran. My father was Catholic. My mom was not, uh, didn't practice super heavily. She had some health complications when we were younger. So she didn't always make it to church on Sunday. And we typically went to the Catholic church anyway. So I was raised Catholic. I have one brother. uh, So we were raised Catholic. We went to a Catholic elementary school through six grade and then public junior high and high school in Monticello, Iowa, where we grew up. And I, you know, I would say I had a good foundation in my faith. My father was um, definitely religious, but not overly so. I mean, he made sure that we made it to church on Sunday. We said prayers every night. Um, it, it was part of the family environment that we grew up in, the morality, the expectations, but it wasn't, it wasn't overly heavy by any means. So, I mean, it was kind of comfortable, but in a way I definitely could have used more. Um, um, by the, I'm also a very inquisitive person. So by the time I hit junior high and then high school, I was really, I, I loved science. If you would ask me in eighth grade what I was going to do for the rest of my life, I wanted to be an astronomer. Um, mm-hmm. I just, I absolutely loved the universe and science. I, I loved it um, until I learned how much math was involved in it. And then <laughs> so I got turned math. off to astronomy. Um, but I, I just absolutely loved science. And I started to buy into a lie in, in high school that science and religion are opposed to each other. And that mm-hmm. if I'm going to believe scientific truth that I would have to reject religious truth or reject the Bible. Um, and I actually, that, that's something that I combat pretty heavily as a theology teacher and as a, as a speaker, have a whole talk series uh, discussing the evidence for God. And a big part of that, the start of that talk is how science and religion are not opposed to each other. So it took me a while to, to really figure that out, that science and religion are not opposed. Um, so anyway, throughout high school, I really struggled with my faith um, because I, you know, we all grow up with a certain background. Either we grow up atheist, or we grow up Christian, or we grow up Muslim, or we grow up Hindu. You know, if I, if I was born in India in 1982, I'd have grown up Hindu. You know, right. but I, you know, I was born. My dad was Catholic, and he was a little bit more active than my mom, so he raised me Catholic. Okay, so I'm I'm 14, I'm right. 18, I'm a Catholic. Right, it's just part of who I was. Um, but you know, I was 50 50 on the God question when I was 16, 17, 18 in my later high school years. I wasn't sure if God existed. I went through the motions, but I wasn't super serious about any of it. So I was a had just finished my junior year of high school, and over that summer, I started dating a Baptist girl who was a year older than me, and she was planning to go to a community college nearby and stay working. We worked at the same grocery store at home, uh, stay for the next year or two, and do that. And I'm like, cool, you know, I can I can date this girl who I really really uh, really liked. Um, and this was the first time when somebody really started to ask me questions about my faith that mm. shook my world because I'd never had them asked before and I'd never really been challenged on anything. So she asked me different questions about like, why do you call your priest father and shared scripture verses about call no man on earth your father. And she asked me, well, how do you go to heaven? And I gave the best answer I could come up with at that point. I'm like, will you be a good person? Right, which is mm-hmm. dangerously close to the heresy. I didn't realize it was a heresy at the time of Pelagianism that we can earn our way into heaven. I had no idea about that. Okay, and she's like, well, "How do you go to heaven?" I'm like, "Well, you'd be a good person." She's like, "No, you got to have faith." And she would, you know, she pushed her theological views as she had learned them from her Baptist church, uh, which was great for me to have that exposure. But I remember going home and telling my dad after one of our dates, which turned into a, a discussion and, and me learning and us reading and praying and stuff like that. And I told dad, "Dad, I'm leaving the Catholic Church unless you can give me some evidence that there's some value in it or that it's actually true." And when I was, this was when I was about 17, 18 years. 
old. Uh, unfortunately, I was incredibly arrogant as a teenager. <laughs> Pride is definitely a vice I continue to, to struggle with. Um, but I couldn't even hear my father. Now, my parents had been divorced since I was about 10. And dad had dated a couple of other ladies from other Christian denominations and had really learned a lot about Catholic apologetics, not just Christian apologetics where we defend Christianity in the midst of a, a secular, anti-Christian, anti-God world, mm -hmm. but a specifically Catholic uh, apologetics where Catholics learn about the major questions that were challenged on by uh, other Christians, the big objections that they may have, like, why do you go to confession? Why do you guys have a pope? Why do you pray to Mary and the saints? Which are all incredibly valid questions for some for other Christians right. to ask if they've never had exposure to those types of things. Um, because like, one of the questions I love getting is, why do you worship Mary? Well, that's a big mis misunderstanding. We don't wor worship Mary. So mm -hmm. I started getting in, uh, or dad was into Catholic apologetics because he had had those experiences uh, sharing his faith with other Christian ladies that he had dated. He never got remarried, uh, but had some of those experiences. So I come home and I'm like, I'm leaving the Catholic church unless you can share something with me of value. So he starts to share some of this stuff with me, and, but I couldn't hear him. I was just too prideful, too arrogant, too much of a teenager. It wasn't even going in. I, you know, He would have, use poor grammar and I'm like, I'm probably said a couple of bad <laughs> things already here in this podcast, but he used bad grammar and I'm like, okay, like I can't even hear you anymore because it was just such an 18 year old. So, but he did give me a little booklet to read that I started to open up and started to dig into. And I, it was short. It was only like 40 pages, little booklet. And it just started to blow me away because my girl friend would share things from sacred scripture primarily. And then this little booklet would say, okay, this is what, what the Catholic church teaches, for example. And this is what some people may say as an objection to the Catholic church. And these are the Bible verses that they'll use. And I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what she said. Oh my gosh, this is it. Okay. And then it would say, here's the Catholic response using Bible verses, using history, mm -hmm. using logic. And I was like, whoa, that is deep. And then it would have, okay. And this could be their counter response. And these could be the Bible wow. verses that they would counter back with. And I was like, oh my goodness, I got to share this with her and see if, if, you know, this resonates with her. And then these are the, the counter responses back to that to more fully explain, not just with sacred scripture, but also with tradition, history, logic, etc. And I was like, oh, wow, I was just blown away by it. So I took it back to my girlfriend started sharing it with her because I was starting to get lit up with the Holy Spirit and passionate about the truth. Uh, so I bring it back and I'm like, I, I got to know what she has to say about this. And she really wasn't interested in talking. She was pretty much, I, I don't want to say closed minded in a bad way, but just in an objectively closed minded way. It was, mm. it was, she was interested in her belief and that was it. And I would say my father was in a similar boat. He was, you know, my girlfriend was a very passionate Baptist. My father was a very passionate Catholic. Neither of them were really interested in looking at alternatives. I, on the other hand, discovered at that point in my life that I am absolutely passionate about the truth, period. And um, I, I went through that experience, and I'm like, wow, this is really interesting, but we ended yeah. up breaking up. Um, I don't think her mom liked me very much because I was a Catholic. I didn't realize at that time that Catholics and Baptists were like oil and water on theology, right. even though Catholics and Baptists are like fabulous on moral issues and, you know, conservative yeah. Christian values in, in culture. Um, but theologically, there's there's definitely some points of contention, unfortunately. But it, it really, it, it broke my heart because I fell in love with this girl and it shattered me that there are different Christian denominations out there and that I couldn't be with this girl because we had a different Christian background, because we had different theological beliefs. And my heart started to bleed with an ache that I believe that the Lord has in his own heart, that he founded one church and that we separated it throughout history, our sins mm. on, on all over the board. And as a Catholic today, I don't claim by any means that the Catholic church is perfect or that it, it has been right throughout all of history. There've been grave, intense sins within the Catholic church. So the issues on, on both sides, I mean, even Martin Luther, who's credited with starting the Protestant Reformation said, and he was an Augustinian Catholic priest, right? He said, no matter how bad things are in the Catholic church, we are, should never separate from the Catholic church because we're, we'll never make it better. We'll never make the true church better by doing that. Uh, and it was after that, that he eventually actually separated from the Catholic church. Why? Because money and politics and power and mm -hmm. the German nobles in, in Northern Germany started coming into play and things just got it, they got really, really messy. Uh, it wasn't clean anymore. So it, my heart really started to ache and bleed, I, I feel, with, with God's struggle with how we humans have have divided up Christianity, which is why I love I love being able to get together here, Abby, and get to talk <laughs> and have some ecumenical yeah. dialogue and, and talk about, you know, 
be open and honest yeah. about that there are differences in different denominations and different Christian yeah. perspectives and stuff. But it just shattered me that I couldn't be with this girl who I fell in love with because mm-hmm. we had a different Christian background. So fine, whatever. So I kind of dropped it. I was now going into my senior year. I wish I would have told you, oh, yeah, at this point it changed my life and I got <laughs> passionate for the Lord. And, you know, it didn't happen, though. Um, but it was it was only months away. OK, I had gone through confirmation just a few months earlier at the end of my junior year. And the Holy Spirit, I'm convinced now, was unlocked and was was driving at my soul and wanted a soldier for the Lord. But I wasn't quite ready to be there. And the Lord knows how to bring us along slowly because it takes time for some mm. of us. Uh, and he started me with this girl. That relationship fell apart and I went into the fall of my senior year and I ran into a buddy who um, basically we just went different directions. He, uh, We went to Catholic elementary school together and he was a big wrestler and he did different social things than I did. I got involved in other sports and other activities and we just didn't talk. Well, senior year, he's like, I got to talk to you. So we drove together to maybe an hour away. We were going to go see a movie. We talked the whole way about this experience that he had. We sat in the parking lot. We didn't even go into the movie. We sat there for an hour and continued talking. Wow. Finally, after a couple hours, we're like, all right, you know, we're at a good pause in the conversation. Let's, let's, we're late for the movie. Let's go see when it's going to show again. And it wasn't going to show for another hour and 45 <laughs> minutes. So we're like, well, forget it. Let's just go home because we didn't have that kind of time. We had to work in the evening. So we just went back home and talked. But he had a, he had a God experience. He had a God encounter. And and he was absolutely convinced that God was real. And I was in this boat where, I mean, I wasn't super serious about my faith. I was practicing it, but really menially, not significantly at all. And I was angry with God after this conversation because I'm like, how does my you know, friend, my acquaintance, how, does he, how is he sure that you're real? But I don't know. I, you know, I'm, and I, I was so arrogant. I'm like, I'm the good boy. Like, I don't go out and party. I'm not drinking crazy. I'm not using girls in relationships, you know. But I, I was totally doing all, very steeped in sin in my teen years and very, very far from the Lord and not allowing the Holy Spirit to be active in my life. So I was so arrogant. I'm like, why does my buddy who I judged and I'm like, he, you know, he does this and this and this. How does he get to know that you exist yeah. and I don't? I was so mad about this. So I, that just kind of faded away because God doesn't answer our prayers in our time. He answers them in his time. Uh, so a, a few more weeks go by and I attended a retreat. Um, I was really interested in meeting a girl. That was pretty much my big <laughs> motivator because a buddy of mine said, hey, do you want to go on a weekend retreat uh, at, at this uh, this church? And I'm like, no, I do not want to spend oh my, my weekend gosh. doing that. And he's like, well, and he's brilliant, right? Uh, and he's like, well, consider this, you know, what are the odds that there's going to be a lot of girls there? And I'm like, okay, That's I, see awesome. your, I see your point. See, God knows, <laughs> God knows how to bring us closer to his heart. Uh, so he <laughs> uses the things that are on our heart to do that. And uh, so I go on this retreat, met a lot of great people. It was fun. But that was really where I first encountered God in a heart sense, Mm -hmm. not just in a head sense, not just in the the routine, the habitual life sense, but in, in a heart sense. And I remember, you know, at the retreat, feeling like God had touched my heart. Okay. But also knowing that as a human being, I can be um, misled and I know that I can lie to myself and knowing that my emotions can be manipulated by certain situations. So I'm like, okay, was this experience real? And I I would have to say, yes, I think that this experience was real. I think that there really is a God that I was really touched by something. But just because I think that I've been touched by that God does not mean that the Christian God is real. It does not mean that Catholicism is true. It does not mean that, who knows? Okay, I think that there's a higher power, but I need need evidence. You know, I'm really the doubting Thomas type. Okay, and I'm like, I I need evidence. Like, I've got to find this. So I am... I went on what I would call a truth quest. And my plan when I was, this was fall of my senior year when I was 18. My plan was I'm going to take 10 years and I'm going to study all the world's religions, which I had already started on a little bit with a high school class, but I'm going to study all the world's religions and I'm going to look for which one is actually true, which one really has evidence. If any, they all could be wrong. Who knows? If I find one that actually has some semblance of the truth, then I'll dig deeper into that religion because every world religion has a whole bunch of subgroups and subsects. So then I'll explore that. And I, I, I've got to find the truth if it's out there. I'm not just going to believe what I was taught mm. just because I grew up in that. I didn't feel like there was much credibility in, the, credibility in that. Okay. So I started into this and it, it really didn't take that long. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I found my way back into Christianity. Actually, I'll share this with you. I found my way back into the Western uh, world 
world religions very quickly. Wow. And this was a big part of the reason why is Judaism, Christianity, and Islam attracted me because the, the other world religions, which I actually teach a college credit course on world religions I have for several years at, mm-hmm. at Beckman Catholic High School. And that's been a pleasure to walk students through other world religions and stuff because sometimes people think that they're going to discover all these other truths in world religions and then they realize, wow, um, <laughs> There's not necessarily a lot of really great evidence. If you're looking for evidence for yeah. some of these these you know belief systems, a lot of this stuff has just grown out of humans trying to answer their own questions. And you know, as human beings, we're trying to figure out what happens when I die. Is there a spiritual reality out there? What's the purpose of my life? And it's easy for us to make up answers to those questions if mm-hmm. we're not given the answers to those questions. So what I noticed in the world religions was the Eastern religions were human beings trying to discover truth about what happens when I die and what is the spiritual realm all about, right? And the Western religions were interested in that too. But in the East, they have different conclusions because they say, well, either I was enlightened and I figured it out, or this was handed down throughout people, throughout history, et cetera. You know, these are the sacred texts that we have. This is what we've always practiced, whatever, things that, that can develop over time. Um, and I'm, I'm like, you know, okay, fine. What does the West say? Judaism, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam all claim that, well, we're looking for these answers too, but we believe that this is true because not that just that we're reaching up to the you know universe to try to find answers, but that God himself has actually reached down to us. Mm-hmm. He's made contact with us in his very person. Uh, Judaism would claim with Yahweh God, with Christianity with Jesus Christ. Islam would say that God revealed, Allah revealed himself, uh, his message through the Quran, okay, through, through uh, Angel Gabriel to Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad. So each, I found so much credibility in that. You know, if I'm gonna defend being a Jew or a Muslim or a Christian, I can say, well, why do I believe that this is true? Not just because I think so, or because my culture has done this for years, but yeah. because the God of the universe has actually reached down and told me that this is true. So those three became very attractive to me. And then it was a matter of trying to figure out, well, does Judaism or Christianity or Islam have the truth or more of the truth? Maybe they all have a combination. I didn't really know. Then I really got stuck on the person of Jesus Christ. That became the hinge. And as I approach world religions now with students or in talks and parish missions, it really focuses on Jesus Christ because it comes down to either Jesus Christ is who he says he is or he's not. Right. If he is, then Christianity is the most unique religion in the world. Nobody else claims that God has actually become man. He's come down to earth. He's revealed himself to us. And by doing that, he's revealed us who we are to our own selves and what we're called to and has opened up the gates to eternal life. That's the gospel. That's the kerygma. That's the essential message that Christianity is built on. That is the hope that we're all looking for. And he conquered the, the two things that we could not conquer, right? Like Israel, the Jews were waiting for a savior to save them from the Romans was the, the, thing at the time. But he came and saved us from so much more. He saved us from sin and death Mm. and offered us new life here and eternal life in heaven, freedom from sin and death. Okay. So it really hinges on the person of Jesus Christ. And there's so much fun apologetic stuff to play with that. So that's really what I became convicted of is that, you know what? I believe Jesus really is who he says he is. I think that that's true. And I'll be honest with you, when I was 18, the evidence I had for that conviction was was not great, okay? That I think I actually was kind of um, influenced by my upbringing and Christianity. Mm-hmm. Um, that has since, my, my skeptical nature has since bothered me about that enough that I've continued to dig and, and pulled up resources, A, for myself, but B, for my students and the talks and things that I give um, that has helped solidify that for my really skeptical mind yeah. that I feel very comfortable in, in Christianity amongst the world religions as a very unique uh, religion. So then the question became, okay, Christianity has all these 7,000 plus independent denominations. Like, what do I do with that? And that's yeah. when I when I came into one of my other heart bleeding issues is, and it, it really came back to my issues with that, that Baptist girlfriend is, why are there all these different denominations? And I think that it's a scandal that we run into all these different denominations, that we humans, that through our sin, throughout history, we've created all these different Christian groups with different theologies and stuff, is that when somebody asks the question, hey, I think Christianity Christianity might be true. I wanna follow Jesus. If they're gonna be inquisitive, if they're gonna be skeptical, they're gonna ask the question like I did when I was 18, which one's true? Yeah. 
which one should I be? I mean, there's Lutherans, there's Methodists, there's Episcopalians, there's Evangelicals, yeah. there's free churches, there's different kinds of Baptists, there's Catholics. There's, what, like, what should I be? There's Orthodox. Okay, which one's actually true? Because they all make different claims and they can't all be true. Okay, either there, some are going to be wrong or maybe all of them are going to be wrong and maybe there isn't a true Christianity out there. Okay, so these were all the questions that I was asking, just like the world religions. So then I started to dig in. Okay, and long story short, I ended up becoming convinced that Catholicism is the true church founded by Jesus Christ. That's why I'm Catholic. Now, hopefully that isn't offensive to anybody who's not <laughs> Catholic because, and I say this all the time, even in my Catholic theology classes, is you should not be offended by somebody who's a Jew or a Muslim or a Baptist or an Anglican or whatever they are because of course they believe what they believe is true and they don't agree with you. Otherwise, they wouldn't be what they are. Right. Okay? So then the next step is to have a loving dialogue, a discussion about, well, why do you believe what you believe? And, and here's the trick. This was the difference between my girlfriend and my dad, who were pretty close-minded, and what I discovered about myself and my passion for the truth is I loved listening to other people and getting their perspective because A, that taught me a lot more about my own faith, but I also became much more sympathetic and understanding of why people have their perspectives. That also helped me improve and enhance my own faith because I'd be inspired by their faith. And I'll use a non-Christian example. I love that Muslims pray five times a day facing Mecca. I'm like, you know what? If we did that as Christians or me explicitly as a Catholic, if I would have five set times a day where I would actually pray and sit down with sacred scripture and, and other various inspiration uh, pieces uh, for me as a Christian and various devotionals, if I would do that, that would be an incredibly powerful experience for me. And, but I still don't do it. I'm still inspired by it, but I still right. haven't committed yeah. to doing it, right? Like having a busy life, you know, I, I just don't do that. But I love Muslims who actually do that, okay? I have respect for anyone who has a belief system and they're consistent with their belief system, okay? Um, or like... Um, the Mormons, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I love that they have their mission activity. I, I'm not necessarily excited when Mormons show up at my door, <laughs> but I love that they have that passion to go out and they're willing to share it with me and share it with everybody yeah. else. And I wish, I'm like, man, why don't we have this in Catholicism, this two, three, two and a half year training period for anybody who wants to become a missionary where they can get trained in really evangelizing and sharing the gospel and grow deeper in their faith. How much better will they be for the rest of their lives if they have that two, two and a half year experience? Experience. So I actually, I'm crazy inspired by that. So I love any, you know, any religious group that's going to yeah. do what they do right and be consistent about what they believe. I really, really respect that. Um, however, like I said, you know, I, I became convinced that Catholicism was true. So then my issue became, all right, God, what do you want me to do with this? Okay. And in college, I basically discerned this, not that I'm going to go out and I'm going to try to, you know, get other people to join up you know, my religion to become Catholic or whatever. But I, I really saw a, a, a health issue within my own Catholic church in, the, in my own denomination that I'm like, you know what? Catholics aren't really Catholic a lot of times. They don't really understand their faith. Like I'd gone through this, you know, multi-month process where I was uncovering and digging and reading and reading and reading and studying and trying to find out where the truth really was. And I'm like, Catholics don't know this. And if they don't know this, they're not going to be able to live the truth. And if they can't live the truth, they're not going be able to share the truth. So I really discerned that, you know what, I'm not going to go out and try to convert my Lutheran family members to become Catholic. I feel called to help Catholics be Catholic, to help mm -hmm. the ones who are already involved really understand what the truth actually is and live that more deeply. And I basically stuck to that now for almost, well, it's over 20 years now, I guess, is wow. really feeling like, you know what, I've, I've got to help Catholics be Catholic. The primary way that I've done that ever since is being a Catholic high school theology teacher uh, and really trying to help teens unpack that. And then doing some with, you know, the book writing that I shared with you already uh, and also the talks that I give, uh, do a lot of parish missions, uh, visiting parishes, visiting some Catholic schools, stuff like that. So it's been an incredible blessing to share some of that story, but really a lot more of the evidence uh, that has led me to belief in Jesus Christ, led me to belief in the truths of Catholicism and, and why, and being willing to share that with others and try to make a difference in their own spiritual yeah. lives. So that's kind of the sum up of the story. I mean, <laughs> oh, the last 20 it. years gets sums up pretty, summed up pretty quickly. I love it. I think for me, like as I reflect on like what you were just saying, I was taking notes as you were writing, but it's just like, I, and even talking about, you know, like how you believe like, you know, God really created 
you know, an open concept. I think I heard it once where it's like God created, if God's people were a house, like it's an open concept house. That's what he created it to be. You stand in the living room, you can see into the kitchen, you can see into like, you know, the living room, the bedrooms, but like we as humans, because of our faults have put up these walls and we built these walls and we built these rooms of different denominations and we ushered people into those rooms as categories. And I think like that to me, as I, like I'm personally and am unpacking this and understanding this concept of, of like, unity in Christianity I feel like God's really been taking me on this journey of like that he that was never his intention is to have the the many different denominations but like he wanted us to be all one underneath him and I think like you nailed that like concept so I appreciate you sharing that on the podcast too so um and like as I'm like looking through my notes like Lord the Lord brings us slow along slowly like sometimes I feel like some people have like these awesome light switch moments. Like you were talking about your friend who had that God moment where it was like a light switch for them. And I think my husband explained it to me once too, because I feel like for me, it was like a light switch moment where I really went into my faith. And he's like, he was more like a dial where it's like it turned up and like, you don't, you, there was no specific moment where you're like, yep, that was it. It was more of a dial that just kept turning um, as you go. And so like, I think that's like so important for those who are walking through their faith slowly is like, it's okay. Like we're all on our own journey of, of figuring out where we stand. And I think like that, your testimony of apologetics and really diving into it, I think that's so inspiring. Yeah, let me touch on that just a little bit because I really like that dial concept. Um, several times in sacred scripture, God either in the Old Testament or Jesus in the New, New Testament says, and I love this because I feel this as a teacher, there's so much more I want to share with you, but you just can't handle it right now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like God totally understands how to walk us through his full revelation. Yeah. I mean, that's what the Old Testament is. It's like, you know what? I want to give you my son. Mm-hmm. And people ask, well, why didn't God just send his son right away? You know what? You can't handle it now. Like you're going to need to walk along a little bit. You know, a question some of my students will bring up sometimes is, well, why, why is monogamy an issue? Like, why can you, why can't we have multiple spouses and practice polygamy or something like that? Didn't Kings, you know, David and Solomon have a whole bunch of wives in the old Testament? Well, yeah, they did. Okay. And then <laughs> great, great King David, for example. But right. here's the issue is God was in the process of revealing his vision for marriage and sexuality over, over time. Okay. And the same thing is true in our own life. So I oftentimes encourage people to look at our uh, faith journey as a relationship. Okay, mm-hmm. it's our relationship with God, and it's it's not a destination that we get to instantaneously. It's a gradual unfolding in that relationship of love. So I totally agree with you. We've got to be willing to allow ourselves the patience of taking that time. You know, as a teacher, we've got to walk people through our their faith journey. And there's a lot of times it's hard for me. I'm not a patient person. Like, <laughs> you know, I, you can probably tell I talk kind of quickly. But most people listen to their podcast at 1.5 or two right? two times speed. So maybe you're going to listen to it at one and a half, you know, one and a quarter for this. I don't know if you have to go all the way down to one, but <laughs> I like to talk pretty quickly because my brain tends to run pretty fast on me. But yeah, I mean, God um, God needs to take, he, he's willing to be a good teacher and take the time we need to process the truths as he throws them at us. So yeah. I totally agree with you there. Let me go back to your analogy about the house too, because I like to play with that for a minute. Um, as I was uncovering Christianity and, and, and looking at that, I heard a really interesting analogy because, you know, I, th- I think, I'll just share my perspective on this. Feel free to disagree. But um, I think that when Jesus Christ founded a church, he really intended it as one church. And his prayer in the garden is uh, so, so powerful about that. He's praying to the Father and he's talking about the apostles and he, he uses the word oneness and unity over and over again about how I, Jesus, am one with you, Father, and I want them, my apostles, to be one in me and one in you so that they may may be together as one, that the whole church may be one. St. Paul hammers at this as well in his letters. He's like, you guys strive for unity, okay? You don't mm-hmm. d- be divided. Well, I was baptized by Apollos and well, I was baptized by yeah. Paul. No, 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 Paul says like, we are one family. It's meant yeah. to be just one family. And that that early church was, was very visible, okay? Now, I didn't realize until I started studying what's called the early church fathers. And these would be the big guns from the first four centuries of the church's history on what they believed. I didn't realize how incredibly Catholic they were until I started digging in and wrestling with different Christian denominations. I'm like, should I be a Methodist? Should I be a Presbyterian? Should I be an Anglican? Should I be a Catholic? Should I, whatever. And I got to give Orthodoxy a lot of credit here because it's not fair for me to say that Catholicism was the true church founded by Jesus Christ, that it was the church of the, of the New Testament. 
It, in a way, it's true to say that. But in reality, the Catholics and the Orthodox were the church founded by Jesus Christ. They were there, okay? And when you look at the early church and you look at what did they believe about the saints? What did they believe about Mary? What did they believe about what happens with the bread and wine at church, at the Lord's Supper? Does it actually become literally Jesus' body and blood? Or is it just a symbolic meaning? It's symbolic Jesus, presence of Jesus, okay? What is that? When you look at the early church, it is very explicitly Catholic slash Orthodox that there, and I was just blown away as I was wrestling with Christianity. I'll get a little bit more into that, I guess, uh, of should I be Catholic? Should I be Orthodox? Should I be Lutheran? Like, what should I be? Is that there's really three divides in Christianity. There's Catholics and Orthodox, and they are pretty darn close in terms mm-hmm. of theology. And then you have Protestantism, and that includes non-denominationalism that, you know, have Protestant theology, but they don't want to commit to being a denomination, so they call themselves non-denominationals. Um, Protestantism has a lot of things in common. For example, sola scriptura, sola fide, concepts that come out of Martin Luther. Um, concepts that as I wrestled with and, and really struggled with, I'm like, okay, can I, can I believe these? When I realized the, the historical roots and as well as the biblical roots of, and the, his history is what I already mentioned here, <laughs> of these doctrines, I really realized that I think Martin Luther was completely wrong about a lot of these issues. not He was not wrong in his 95 Theses about problems in Catholicism. There were major issues within Catholicism at the time that needed to be reformed, for sure. But Martin's new theology that he invented that had not been true for 1,500 years, including how you get saved, how you go to heaven, he brought up brand new ideas and theologies that had never believed, been believed by any Christian for 1,500 years of the church's history. And I looked at that and I said, oh my gosh, I've had friends, Christians, acquaintances throughout college tell me, how can you be a Catholic? How can you be part of a church that's founded by men and not founded by the church of Jesus Christ? And what I discovered by studying history and the church fathers was that Catholicism slash orthodoxy was actually, and you can prove it historically, was actually founded by Jesus Christ and every other Christian denomination was actually founded by men or women, Mm. depending upon when they were founded and what the dates are. And that just like, it really, really rocked my world. And then it made it easier for me to look at Christianity and go, you know what? I, I can't be Protestant. I love my Protestant brothers and sisters, my cousins, my friends, my acquaintances. I respect their theology and where they're coming from, but they're missing out on key ideas and buying into, to some issues. So back to your analogy of the house. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the way that I kind of look at it is the, the the church would be like that, that house. And then the Catholics and the Orthodox ended ended up getting in a big fight around 1054 AD and then dividing each other. So that they kind of put up a wall in, in the church. And then you have some other people in the church, we'll say in the the Catholic side, the Western side of the house who um, said, you know what, there, there's some truth here, like sacred scripture and Jesus Christ and the Trinity, you know, but there's also some things that they didn't like. We'll do, Martin Luther, for example, okay? Uh, and Martin basically took a lot of truths from in the house, okay? He kind of got grumpy and he's like, I'm, I'm leaving, I'm mm-hmm. done. I'm gonna protest against this, hence Protestant. So he went up to his bedroom and he grabbed his his uh, suitcase and he grabbed his sleeping bag and he grabbed his tent and he grabbed his flashlight and he went to the pantry and he grabbed a whole bunch of resources and, and good stuff that comes from inside the house, truths of Jesus Christ, right? Like the New Testament. And he takes these and he goes and he sets up shop in the backyard and he sets up his tent, okay? And he's got all this stuff, right? Right? And he's got good stuff out there. He's got sacred scripture. He's got elements of salvation for sure. I'm not saying that Catholics are the only people going to heaven. They're not. The Catholic Church explicitly says that other Christians are going to heaven, that the Holy Spirit is at work. Jesus Christ is present in other Christian denominations. Okay, But Catholicism sees itself as the true church of Jesus Christ. Okay, so um, Martin Luther setting up shop. He's got his tent in the backyard. And then people start disagreeing with Martin Luther. And mm-hmm. they're like, no, that's not right because they interpret sacred scripture differently. And then they set up their own little tent in the backyard and they're all still on the same property. And then you've got the Catholics and the Orthodox who are fighting inside the house a little bit. Yeah. And they're looking out and they're going, what are you guys doing out there? And and in my struggle with, with talking to people is a lot of times we are closed-minded and we're not willing to open our hearts and minds to really listen to where's the other person at? Um, and I tell my students all the time, I'm like, if you're going to have a conversation with somebody and you're going to share your faith with them, you first have to be willing to 
authentically listen to where they're at, yeah. hear their faith testimony and go, where are they coming from? You have to be willing to convert if you're going to expect somebody else to convert. And that's not what I get from Jehovah's Witnesses and from my Baptist girlfriend and from <laughs> uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints from Mormons very often. But every now and then I run into that with another authentic Christian and we get to have really great conversations. Yeah. I can't say that I've ever experienced a conversion experience out of that. Okay, I take that back. There has been a couple, but... They were family members, so they were they were prone to find their right. way to Catholicism. Uh, I suppose that's that's my ridiculous bias. You got to bear with me on that. So anyway, that that's just a perspective I'd share. Um, there, there's yeah. one guy, um, Saint John Henry Newman, was a Anglican priest, uh, and he really wanted to discover what did worship look like in the early church amongst the early Christians. Okay, and obviously he's an Anglican priest. He's very passionate about uh, the Lord. Okay, he committed his life to the Lord. And he started studying the early church, these early early church fathers that I talked about. And he discovered how Catholic slash Orthodox the early church really was. And he converted about halfway through his life. He became a Catholic. And he said this quote that just continues to ring in my ears. He said, to be deep in history, to really understand history, is to cease to be a Protestant. And it reminds me a lot of this experience that Martin Luther had. You see, there right before the Protestant Reformation was really getting going, Martin Luther was in a series of debates with a guy named Cardinal Cajetan, who was a major apologist on behalf of the Catholic Church. And he was a cardinal, so he was a high-ranking uh, official in the church as well. And at the end of one of their debates, Cardinal Cajetan said something to Martin Luther that bothered Martin Luther for the rest of his life. And I, I, I say this only because Martin Luther wrote about it later in his life. And he said, Martin, if you're right about this stuff and the Catholic Church is wrong about these things that you're protesting against, things essential, not, not just minor league elements, but essential elements like salvation, like how you go to heaven, okay, like the authority of the church. Does the church have authority to interpret sacred scripture, or is every individual Christian allowed to interpret sacred scripture for themselves, okay? He said, if you're right, Martin Luther, and everybody else is wrong, okay, then that means that the church has been wrong for 1,500 years and you have the true gospel. And that, that some Christians say, oh, it was, it was around for the first century and then it was lost for you know, 1,400 years until Martin Luther shows up again. But that concept bothered Martin Luther for the rest of his life, that for at least 1,400 years, all of Christianity had it wrong. Because when you go back to the early church fathers, the guys and, and gals who studied directly under the apostles, who studied under, I love reading from St. Ignatius of Antioch, who studied under St. John, because a big, a big point of contention sometimes amongst Christians is, what happens at the Lord's Supper? Does the bread and wine really become body and blood or not? You know, Orthodox, Catholics, Lutherans, Presbyterians, Baptists, all have different views on that, mm -hmm. okay? So what, what did John mean in John chapter 6? Was he being literal that bread and wine actually become body and blood or not? Well, if you read from St. Ignatius, St. Ignatius of Antioch, who wrote around 110, uh, 100 to 110 AD on his way to martyrdom in Rome, he was a bishop of the early church. If you read what he had to say, he was very explicitly literal about it. And it's very Catholic slash Orthodox, his interpretation of John chapter 6. And I love it because St. Ignatius of Antioch sat at the feet of John. Okay, St. Ignatius of Antioch knows how to interpret John because he learned directly from John. Okay, and this was the kind of study that made me at, at 18, 19, 20 years old, late high school, early college go, I have to be a follower of Jesus Christ and I have to be Catholic. That is the church that he founded. And it's flawed and it's got major problems and that's what I've committed my entire life to is repairing those flaws and trying to help Catholics be authentically Catholic. And it's a struggle because I'm dealing with one of the biggest problems every day, myself. Okay, yeah. I have this constant resistance to following the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ, and yet I have this intense, passionate attraction that I can never get away from to follow Jesus Christ as the way and the truth mm. and the life in my own sinfulness and my own brokenness. To be honest, I I like it and like admire your passion for it because I can see like that's like truly like your heart is is for that. So like I am so thankful that you're here on this podcast sharing it because like I said, like I I was excited to have you on because of your Catholic background. And that sounds kind of crazy um, to think about, but I really truly believe that there is something like you spoke on it earlier. There's something about opening your ears and listening to, to fellow brothers and sisters, you know, in Christ, no matter the denomination to have a conversation and to, you know, speak the truth and to specifically like what you believe as Catholic. So I think that is like, I'm just like honored that you're here speaking into that because there's things that I'm not, now I'm like, man, I want to dive into that myself and like reread that. So um, yeah, I just, I'm so thankful that you came on to share your testimony. I'm thankful that you came on to share some light on 
on the Catholic Church, and I'm just like, yeah, so thankful that God orchestrated this to happen. All right, so why don't we close out in prayer, unless you have any final no, we're good. words. Good? Yeah, okay. sounds great. You, you close this out. Sure. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of Abby's podcast and seeking your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we all feel that we can't escape that calling that you put on our hearts, that desire that there is a truth. You give us a conscience that is your voice within our own hearts, the truth of our moral life, what we need to be doing, letting you into every part of our life to be our Lord. We feel that calling that you're the only way. You are the only way, the only truth, the only life for salvation, not just in heaven, but also in this world to be freed not only from death, but also to be freed from sin and to experience the beauty and grace that you have planned for us, A, for eternal life, but B, even in this world. And Lord, we know that you're calling us to make a difference in everybody's life around us, to our spouses, to our neighbors, to our coworkers, to our friends. Lord, whatever that biggest issue, right, biggest calling in our life right now, God, we'll just take a moment of silence to discern this together, friends. God, whatever that biggest issue you want us to do today or this week, share that with us in our hearts. What is the big thing that you want us to do or to stop doing in our life? We'll take a couple seconds and God, just help our hearts to see it clearly. God, thank you for the gift of leading us to truth. Your son, gradually, slowly, because of our brokenness, we can't handle it all at once. And you are the perfect teacher, the perfect parent, the perfect lover, that you will lead us there slowly and faithfully and that we can always trust in you. We give thanks to you, God, for the truths that you've shared with us, for your son. We ask you to fill our lives with the Holy Spirit and help us to become the people you're calling us to be. Amen. Amen. All right, Anthony, thank you again so much for coming out to the podcast. You and bet. For those who are listening, I will link all of Anthony's um, many things that he's done, YouTube channels, uh, books. We'll link all of those in the show notes below. So if you'd like to check out more information, you can click on the links below in the description. All right, everyone, have a great rest of your week, and we'll talk to you again next Tuesday. You just finished another episode of the Seeking After Him podcast. I'm over here giving you a virtual hug and a high five for making it this far. If you are interested in checking out more information or staying in touch throughout the week, you can head on over to the Seeking After Him social media platforms on Instagram and Facebook at Seeking After Him podcast. I can't wait to chat again next week, friend. See you soon.